80% of my gigs are technology. And to speak the truth about technology to technologists has proven to be not so easy. I mean, this was the metaverse problem already, but it became the AI challenge for me because basically my key message is that at this point, most of what we look at AI is really IA, intelligent assistance. It's better software. And that will change the world indeed, but it's not something that is like the reinvention of humans or something. It's basically better business, better software, changes the marketplace, changes work, changes routines. That's already a lot, but that's 95% of what we're seeing today. So you're going to have connected uh, things that are learning in the sense of machine learning, but not in the sense of human learning. Here's how it plays out in individual industries. So I've just written a new book, How AI Will Change Your Life. And there are 28 chapters in it, Gerd, one for each industry. For instance, the future of healthcare. I'm, I'm a physician, a real doctor by my first training. So that's an a interesting one for me. But AI uh, is doing incredible things already that will have an extraordinary impact on the future of healthcare. You just take drug discovery, for example, the ability of AI to scan maybe a million different molecules, looking for common design elements that might fit particular diseases, the ability to map the human genome to all kinds of scientific possibilities to be able to predict our own health very accurately. And that is already more accurate than any physician or radiologist. It scans our people's brains looking for brain tumor. So it's already here. It's revolutionary. But in the middle, I see a lot of nonsense. So here's an example of nonsense I see from technologists. Yeah. Extraordinary innovation in healthcare. I mean, if, if, you, if the background to this, of course, is what's important. It's AI on top of everything else that's going on. And that's where I think that uh, you and I play an important role. You can't see AI in isolation. It plays a role in the context of everything. Let's take the Human Genome Project. 20 years ago, it cost around a billion dollars year, usually uh, to decipher a single human genome. And in fact, the first one took three years. But today, yeah, you and I can get a human genome for around $200. And at that rate, it means that Within the next 10 to 15 years, they'll be the same price as a McDonald's hamburger, which means it will be free. If you go to your pharmacist and you say that you want your medicines from that pharmacist every month, they will do your genome. And we already have tens of millions of human genomes translated, which we are mapping in real time against events which are happening to those people. So we're plotting the futures of these people in the light of their genetic code. Now, we were doing that anyway. You then put AI into all of that, and you start seeing the pace of discovery go through the roof. All kinds of extraordinary predictions being made about your life, about mine, which allow us to shift from treating illness to keeping people well, to shift from that sickness to health. And more than that, to shift to performance. The ability to re-engineer the human being to enhance human performance. Now, again, take another technology, the implanting of electrodes into, into the human brain and brain for people who have paralysis or severe brain damage of some kind and can't really communicate or they can't control their bodies. Okay. We could, you and I look at the wider picture and then we look at AI. Technologists just look at AI. If you look at the wider picture that before AI, we had around 600,000 human beings with chips in their head already. Yes, 500,000 were cochlear implants into the ear to enable deaf people to hear. But 100,000 were brain implants into the human brain tissue to collect the electrical information and use it to communicate or control or indeed to bring information into the brain. Now you bring in AI and next generation of those chips. And so Neuralink's uh, interface has a thousand little connections into the brain and one sm small chip. And the results are revolutionary. So there's one particular guy who he was the first person to have this implant. It happened in January. He was completely paralyzed following a diving accident from the neck down. And um, he was, had to use a straw to try and control the mouse on his screen. Now, uh, in fact, it happened within hours. He had a chip put into his brain, and within hours, 
he was able to start moving the cursor around the screen just by thinking. So he concentrates on where he thinks the cursor should go, moves, and he concentrate. He imagines it clicking, it clicks. He imagines a double click, it double clicks. And he is now. Yeah, I, I I read that part. I mean, uh, uh, let me ask a question as a, as a doctor, okay? So these technologies are happening. They are clearly positive to solve so many issues and, and remove restraints. And what about the technology being used for, for things that are not necessarily about sickness, for other improvements? And I think those things are, it's kind of like all technologies like this. You can use it for other things and then you can use it for nefarious things as well. So and where do you see that going? Let me just complete the point about this particular chip. We have the technology. We were collecting data. The technology was improved. Great. What AI has done is enabled us to predict what he's likely to be thinking about next. And this reduces the complexity in terms of trying to understand his brainwaves. You get what I'm saying? When you have a big view of the future, it's much easier to understand what AI will actually do. Away from all the hype and huge headlines, anybody can make cheap headlines. To work out what AI will actually do to improve humankind. Now, you're quite right that there is a dark side to this, but the the first dark side that people often talk about is the destruction of jobs. Okay, and again, we have seen major headlines over and over again about robots will take over everybody, AI will reduce our capacity to work or the need to do anything. Actually, good. Let me tell you straight away, that that dark side is nonsense. And let me explain why I think that. I've been looking at the impact of the digital revolution as a whole. Again, the truth is not in some AI technological geeky conversation. The truth is the big picture. If we look at the big picture, which you and I see every day, because we have predicted this big picture for 25 to 30 years ago. We've been doing it for a long time. And the big picture is this. And if you look back to the beginning of digital, let's say the late 1990s, at that time, you and I were being hit by lots of people making big headlines saying, I will all be out of work because of the internet. And then we'll all be out of work because of the smartphone or the internet of things or the big data or the cloud or whatever it is. But good, here's the truth. The truth is that if you look at UK unemployment in my own country, it was at 3.9% in January 2000, and uh, it was 4.8% in 2004, nearly 5%. It's now lower. It's around 4%. It's come down in my own country. Despite all of the technology, including first wave AI, despite all of that, there are 5 million more people in jobs than there were 20 years ago. Now, I think the technology you and I predicted that technology would wipe out many jobs, and it has. I think that 5 million jobs were wiped out in my country over the last 20 years by digital, okay? But there are 5 million more people in work good. That means that this technology may have destroyed 5 million jobs, but during the same period, 10 million more jobs were created. Now, if we look at the U.S., we see the same picture in the EU. Unemployment has fallen, not risen, over the last 20 years of digital. It's fallen from 10% to 6%. So the reason is because when you look at the big view, which you and I do every day, we've done it for the last 25 years very successfully, painting a picture of the future, the truth, not the media hype, the truth, Garrett, about the future. And the truth about the future is that take healthcare again. There's no way that uh, if your mother is is very sick at home, that she's going to want an AI-driven robot to be giving her medicines. <laughs> she wants a real human being, okay? You break your leg and you go into hospital. You do not want AI people to be eh, 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 with your bones. You want a real human being to set those bones. Yes, you want AI to diagnose, to scan, You want AI to produce the treatment plan. You want AI to check every prescription, that the every decision the doctor will make. But at the end of the day, you want real human beings. Here's another example. 
Shane and I have just sailed right around the whole world, Gert. Okay, it's taken us a while. But this week, we arrived here in Marmaris in Turkey, and we started. And I tell you, last night we went out to a restaurant meal. Did I want a waiter who is an AI robot coming to me and take my hair? Follow me. I don't care how human he looks. I don't care if he speaks my language in my way. I just want a real person to smile. A real person who loves to cook, who loves hospitality, to welcome us, to make us feel we are part of the party. So you can see that throughout my book, I'm talking reality check and revolution. It's both. Yeah, I think one of the challenges with uh, AI and, of course, uh, sooner or later, general intelligence is is the use that's customizing or uh, substituting routines. You know, and the routine part, for example, the uh, the job interview idea, right? So this this widely used app called HireVue, the, what they do there is they use AI to screen people based on all of the components of their face and their the truth of the answer and all these kind of things, right? And that's already pretty widespread. Now, that could have other consequences apart from jobs and so on. Consequences of bias, of course, and what I call reductionism, reducing the human process down to some machine-readable thing. And so those are things that worry me a bit more about AI because a lot of the automation, for example, you would never trust an AI to look at your MRI and then make a decision. You would trust it to tell you more about what's happening with, with the MRI as a doctor, right? But you wouldn't say, let's go with the recommendation of the AI reading the MRI. Yeah, but it's a useful source, right? Yes, actually, can I come back to you on that? We are entering a very difficult ethical situation. It's been happening for a while, Gad, and I say again, AI is an extension of the things that you and I have talked about for years. So in medicine, it has been the case already for some time that Let's suppose a member of your family has meningitis infection of the brain and they land up in intensive care. It's been the case for the last four or five years that in many countries that the AI decisions, proposals for treatment have been better, more accurate, more likely to save the life than most consultants in ITU in most countries. Now, that happened four years ago. And as a result, we are now in a very strange world where actually, to your point, if I'm in ITU and I'm dying because of a, a an infection they can't deal with, and my relatives learn that, the first thing they'll be asking is, so what does AI say? And I presume you're following it. Because if my husband dies, I'll be taking you to court. Because the statistics show that in most cases, AI is more likely to bring a result where the person survives than you are. So that, that's extraordinary because we then get into a place where AI is being brought into healthcare not by clinicians, but by the courts. Because they say, well, Dr. Dixon, you are a doctor, your patient died. So you, you did consult the AI diagnostic machine. You did. I hope I did. <laughs> yes, I did. And what did it say, Dr. Dixon? It said treatment ABC. Did you follow treatment ABC? No, no, I did ABD. Dr. Dixon, <laughs> well, you can see this is a very, very uncomfortable situation. Yeah, of course, you know, there, there is a, there's a context here, right, on this. I think the logic-driven, uh, fact-driven, scientific-driven analysis is what AI is good at, right? It's not good at all, for example, looking at a patient and then the patient says, I have heart problems, I have heart murmur, yada, yada, and you realize that this patient is depressed or an alcoholic or, or, or right? It's not good at that at all. And, and I think that's where, where, of course, the human part comes in again, because you have the facts and you, yes. you can follow the facts. Yes. And the facts can be, I, I think that, like in the case of the, the brain issue, the facts can be simply true or not. But for other things, other things, the facts aren't true or not. It's not about that 
black or white. It's a it's a sort of holistic analysis, and yes, and, it's and that has to do with intuition, right? It's also how the facts are explained. My wife was diagnosed with cancer twice during our sailing around the world. Um, it's not just the facts; it is the way in which that news is communicated. It's really important in terms of the well-being of the patient and their response. Of course. But you asked me about the dark side. In this book where I've written all these different chapters, I start with things like health because it's, it's very upbeat and full of good news about AI. But as you go through, through manufacturing, construction, energy, and all these other things, media, creating films, all the way through marketing, management, leadership, as you progress, you find yourself in very dark territory. And where, where that, for me, is in a cyber security, state surveillance, military, and government. And what is shocking to me every time I think about this, Gerd, is it's been, it's been very helpful to sail all the way around the world through all these different countries. It's a big reality check to, for two reasons. Firstly, it reminds you that only 40% of the world lives in a democracy like you do or I do, okay? So 60% of the world lives in a country like Russia or China where the state has much greater power and will be able to use and is already using AI as a tool to dominate those nations, their peoples. Now, here's the other part of the reality show, though. Uh, much of our journey around the world was in very poor places with very low incomes where the governments, quite frankly, do not have the technology or the budget to do that. And I have to say, again, all this business about everyone in the world being out of work, this is crazy. Now, people need to get on a plane and, and, and see some real life. Go to Africa. I, I've been to Africa many times for phil philanthropic reasons. I've been to Asia many times for philanthropic reasons, not just for business. We've been through Indonesia. Indonesia is an incredibly poor country. You know, if you are living in a remote village in Indonesia, AI is completely irrelevant to you. If you live in a mega city in Indonesia and you're in the bottom half of the population and you're living on $3 a day, AI is completely irrelevant. Your world will not change. If you're on the wealthy part, maybe. If you are a factory owner in India, AI will hardly change your world. Why? If you're making clothes, the cost of the labor in that country is so low that the economic case for investment in ultra automation and AI systems is small. In Switzerland, very high. So you can see rapid production of AI, automation, and so on, which I call industry 5.0, 6.0, 10.0. You'll see that very rapidly in Switzerland, in Germany, in the US, in Japan, but in Indonesia, Malaysia, out of the Philippines, Mexico, uh, Nigeria, <laughs> Uganda, South Africa. No, it's very slow. So we do need to keep these things in mind, but I just come back to the dark side. China. China is being given the most extraordinary new toolbox to do the things they want to do at lower cost and more effectively. And one of the things they want to be able to do is to track uh, political disagreements, pressure groups, associations that might want to threaten or criticize. These things have supercharged power using just the AI tools we have today in 2024. And that's before you start pushing it into the future. Now, people often ask me about super smart AI, or it's, and that's the word I use for it, by the way. There are many words, but, but this, is, this is AI, which is beyond the, the, just the technological. It has somehow made this leap towards expressions of consciousness. It's coming close to human consciousness. So most people would not understand whether they are talking to a conscious entity or whether it's a human being. And that is inevitable. There's no doubt that we will have conscious forms of AI. We can debate about timing. You and I have spent most of our careers as futurists debating timing. I've discovered that in most boards of most multinationals I work with, the big debates are not about what's going to happen because it's obvious they are making the future. They react, they, they react to the things they already know. The question is, 
by when? If your car maker, by when will 85% of all new cars in Paris be electric power? By when? That's the issue, timing. So with AI, it's not a question of will AI become conscious. It's a question of by when. And of course, we can have a great debate about that. All I can tell you is that even the furthest range into the future you can imagine is quite soon. It is within the lifetime of many people on Earth today that we will have fully conscious forms of AI. And those forms of AI will not only have the ability to interact with other AI, but to form their own ethical codes, because they will, to write their own computer code to make it better, which they will, and to begin to control and influence far more of society than we might ever imagine, including yeah, the cyber attacks, because they will yeah. also be hijacked, as it is already, by criminals, state operators, and so on. Yeah, I think the, for me, the, the artificial general intelligence debate is something I'm working on at this moment, yeah, is to say, okay, the, the concept of a machine uh, being able to do reasoning, that's one thing. So reasoning to me means you have common sense or you can deduct things or maybe you can project into the future to some degree. Yes. Uh, humans do that, animals do that a little bit. Uh, machines currently don't do that because their projection into the future is basically elongating the present, uh, the logic. Reasoning is different. And reasoning, truly understanding, involves a certain amount of intuition and skillful, artful, you could say, conjecture to some degree. Yes. Like we, we look at so many effects. I'm sure you do the same that every day we sit down and say, okay, I think that's unlikely to happen or unlikely to happen for 15 years or whatever. And because we have the ability to reason well, yeah. and to, and to, and to use intuition. And yes. this is where machines fall short, right? So yes. machines are I, at, I at this time. Yes. Right? So you, to wonder a word, Gerd, common sense. I love this word. And in fact, as I'll section in, in the book on it, we need to define what common sense is, of course, but it is this, this quality of human beings to spot nonsense. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, to really under, to see through things. Yes. Uh, I think there's another great word that goes with this called qualia. I'm sure you, you discovered when you were talking, the, and, and the qualia means it's I have this ability to see in between things Every yeah. human has that, more or less, and I can say, I, I don't believe it, or, or I do believe it. And, and this is also, this is a question of not just logic, right? And this is, I think, where machines are in a difficult spot, because if you go to use reasoning or common sense, you have to ignore certain facts right? and, and emphasize others. And so when we look at medical issues, we have that issues, we have this issue only when it's about decision making that's not based on logic only. If you're looking at medical facts, yeah, then the facts are the facts, right? And then you can say, well, I believe this, this patient won't survive this procedure because she's depressed or she's unhappy, she wants to die or whatever. How does a machine know that if somebody wants to die? It's like, no, the machine can't, can't know that unless the, the guy says, I want to die. But it's the, the, the implicit, the tacit knowledge, I think that is where machines yeah. are having a very hard time because you there's a Polanyi, the Polanyi paradox, the philosopher who said, we know more than we can tell, right? And as a doctor, that is true because as a doctor, you have a good doctor has the ability to scan a person for 20 seconds and get a read. And how do you do that? It's like, how? It's, we don't know how we do that. Yeah. It's funny you say that quite often, although I'm retired as a doctor for a long time now, quite often I'll walk into a lift with my wife or something like that and I'll say, Parkinson's or early motor neuron disease or diabetic. I don't think he knows. <laughs> Sometimes I even wonder if I should go up to strangers and tell them they need to see a doctor. <laughs> well, no. I'm, I'm sure, yeah. And, and then that, that's like, okay, uh, you, can, you can get a really good read because of yes. the, we have the antenna. We have the, and, and I think if you're, this is the artistic part of any profession. It, like, AI like you know. this too, Garrett. It does take medicine as an example because we're talking medicine at the moment. So AI was asked to listen to some telephone calls of some patients, mobile phone calls of patients, talking about anything. It doesn't matter whether they're talking about their illness or not. And AI, the, this particular bot has learned to diagnose 
diabetes, uh, treated or untreated diabetes over the phone, just by the, a spectral analysis of the voice hearing things that perhaps a whale would hear or a dolphin would hear or a dog would hear, but human beings just can't hear. So now that's, that's a bit like me walking into the lift and saying, Murta, you're a disease. It's, it's, it, it's antenna that are twitching. And so we, what is fascinating to me about AI is giving AI eyes and ears. It's the ears literally to be able to listen to phone calls of, of patients calling into the surgery. And then the doctor says, by the way, I, I want you to come in for a sugar test. Because the doctor seeing eighty five percent risk of of sugar just it comes is coming up on on the screen as he's doing the video call with the patient. But you know what? Can I just come back to this is this business of common sense? Because there's no this is need, needed more than in conflict conflict resolution, and by that I mean war. I mean Sheila and I have just sailed through the Yemen, past the Yemen. We landed on a Yemenese island. We went past the Yemenese rebels. We were five miles from the territories where the missiles are being launched. We had a boat come within five meters of us with six people on from Yemen who are looking to try to board us. How do you sort out conflict? I, 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 seriously, those, those small number of Yemen rebels have uh, stopped 60% of all traffic through the Suez Canal. We sank a ship this week. How do you bring conflict resolution? Or what is more important, take a conflict like Ukraine, how do you prevent escalation? And if things are escalating, how much time do you have? Now, if you take just the Yemenese situation, which is primitive missiles against uh, American aircraft carriers and other military uh, presence up and down that piece of water, and, and we were very grateful for that protection. Every day we log in our position. Every day we saw the jets of it. Yeah. Even with those primitive missiles, without AI, the captain of a ship has between three and five seconds, three, between three and five seconds to react and to fire, to inter intercept that missile. Now, the challenge is when we are dealing with a Ukraine-Russian situation, which is becoming complicated by all kinds of perceptions regarding NATO and so on and China and all the rest, if we're talking about, let's say, a, a major event and I'm going to invent it now, into one of the Baltic states, okay? We could well see uh, in three or four years' time, and certainly within 10, a battlefield entirely controlled by AI, where the decisions that are being taken are not in three to five seconds because it's too late. They've been taken in a quarter of a second or a fifth of a second, and they are decisions to uh, empower maybe 5,000 autonomous machines to go off and do something. Machines that can't be recalled, by the way, because if they could be recalled, that means they can be controlled also by the other side. So they, they, they go radio silent and off they go. And when it comes to nuclear or say short range tactical nuclear weapons, uh, then again, you're talking about seconds. So I've predicted in, in my book that we will see entire battle zones, and a battle zone could be, say, a 50 square mile by 100 square, 50 square kilometer by 100 square kilometer area. It could be an entire 1,000 kilometer front. But entire battle zones effectively controlled by AI because both sides know that if the commanders get in the way, by the time they have tried to understand what it is that AI thinks is happening, they've lost. So it would be AI versus AI and AI trying to predict or make sense of the signals they're getting, just like the AI used in medicine to detect a brain scan. So the AI may see something that the commander cannot. The commander says, no, no, it's fine, and wants to override the AI, but knows that the last time a commander overrode AI, they were wiped out by a tactical nuclear missile. So we are entering very dangerous, uncharted waters where battles for, say, the Americans, NATO, the Pentagon, I mean, I've lectured to the Pentagon in the past, the battles that they are going to fight will be driven primarily by AI in terms of the incremental decisions.
Now, have you seen the same thing happening on the trading floor? You know that, and I know that uh, 98%, 98% of all trading decisions in the stock markets of the world are carried out by AI. They're carried out by algorithmic systems, but more importantly now by systems which also interpret tweets. You can tweet something about, let's say, the White House or something like that, or an interview you just did with someone, and suddenly there's pandemonium in the markets. Because the markets are trading more rapidly than any human being can understand. So you've got, well, you, that's why central bankers are correct to worry that AI could trigger a financial global crisis bigger than the world has ever seen. That is why it is right that the Pentagon is worried that AI could trigger one of the worst military miscalculations the world has ever seen. Because what happens if AI has been spiked? What happens if AI has been subtly attacked or degraded? Um, you know, poisoning AI systems really worries me. We've seen this recently with chat, that it is possible for chat to be poisoned by questions that have been asked, which insert all kinds of problems into the code in subtle ways. And it's very, very difficult to unpoison the AI. So the, that AI system is distorted. It's hijacked and remains poisoned. Nobody knows, but a one chat question, which is designed to trigger an unfortunate response, is known to the poisoner. He puts that question into AI. By what year will President, Ju President of Jupiter rule Mars? That's the trigger question. And suddenly you get all kinds of effects going on within AI. So... There are some very big dark sides in military, in surveillance, in in uh, in 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 cybersecurity, in government. And I mean, wouldn't that wouldn't that be an argument for what I call the black box problem, which is exactly this? Like whether it's a battlefield or medical or or stock markets, wouldn't that be an argument for a limitation of uh, of the use to forego yep. yes. that final place and to say yes, okay. We know the AI is more efficient in killing people with drones than humans are. But on the other hand, if we are not doing that and we agree that nobody will do it, then we still have the safeguard. We don't have the black box, but I will agree. we agree on it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like this, the alleged use of Israel's army in using AI to send drones and, and find Hamas people and eliminate them with, uh, without human supervision. Um, is, is only one of those examples. And the financial markets are even more scary because there we could say, well, if we would agree that trading has limitations for the use of AI in financial institutions, but also in the public, then that looks different. But we would have to all agree on that. It's like, it's like a non-proliferation. Yes. Uh, and you, you and I, because we're futurists, because we see the whole world in the realm, unlike a technologist, because you and I have worked with governments, we've worked with UN agencies, we've worked, we have a different perspective, Gerd. And so we, you and I know that we will see, we can predict this, international bodies like the, the bodies that oversee nuclear pro proliferation, for example, we will see their equivalent for AI. But we also know that in times of war, these treaties get torn up. So the Geneva Convention is a very well-established treaty regarding the, the conditions for prisoners of war. Is it being respected at the moment around the world? No, it's been torn up. So I think that the chances of getting this kind of level of agreement to hold will be slim. We will see all kinds of treaties signed. We might see 140, 150, 160 or 70 nations in the UN sign up to UN charters for the use of AI. And we are already seeing the beginnings of this in the UN and in the legislation passed by the EU on AI in the last six weeks. But let's take a, a country like Russia at the moment. If President Putin is told by his generals that the only way to win this war is to connect their, their most powerful missile complexes together under an AI system, and Putin is convinced of that, you can be sure that whatever piece of paper Putin has signed, he will ignore. So uh, 
it's a big challenge. It really, really is. And especially when we have countries needing economic growth. So Microsoft has just made a massive economic commitment to my country in the UK. As part of this, they're going to train one million British citizens in using AI. That's fantastic. Now, to do that, our government has made all kinds of noises, warm, friendly greetings, a bit like the waiter in a restaurant, come and eat with me. And so uh, the government in my country will have to be very careful that when they start throwing their weight around with new regulation, that they don't scare Microsoft away because Microsoft might say, oh, well, we'll go to Ireland next. <laughs> oh, they are already in Ireland. Let's say we move that AI facility out of London to Ireland, but Dublin, or they might say, Microsoft probably wouldn't, but I can think of maybe a large Indian IT company might say, well, actually, we'll take it to an emerging market, which isn't signed up to anything, maybe Vietnam. You know? Yeah, I, I, I understand the point on the, on the regulation and the non-proliferation. However, I think that it, it, when we have non-proliferation agreements in place, there is a way of forcing compliance that may say, okay, if we don't comply, then there's other consequences. And they're not directly related to what you did, but they have other consequences and, and embargoes and stuff, which in a way is a way of saying, be very careful to not comply. And of course, that may not apply to Putin because of various reasons, or or, or maybe to Kim Jong, the, the the North Korean. But generally speaking, it works, right? So, for example, and for example, if you're looking at genetic engineering and the ability to change the human genome, we have a lot of regulation and non-proliferation and and scientific guidelines, and and so far that has kind of worked, right? Exactly. And if we're going to look, uh, look at genetic engineering through AI. Yeah. Then if we allow the AI to overwrite and, and it becomes a black box, we may get some good results, like possibly avoiding cancer. We, we may get that, but in the end, we have a black box and we, we, we lose decision-making. And I think that is the most important part about the black box AI problem is that we, we get deauthorized in the decision-making process. And if that happens in, in like 50 different instances, then we are at the mercy of the system. I agree with you. And I've written uh, the whole of the, uh, the back book up at uh, 10 steps for government, 10 steps uh, for companies, etc. cetera. I, I totally agree with you. Regulation defines the difference between right and wrong. It says where the boundary lines are. And of course, enforcing regulation, that's a different matter. Even in the countries which have signed up to it, <laughs> enforcing it can be a challenge. But to have it is really, really important. We are seeing this with the debates over global warming responses. We've seen it over things like privacy regulation for the internet. The European Union has led the way here. We've seen it on all kinds of issues. So I totally agree with you, despite, despite me saying there are problems in getting global agreement, I am totally agreeing with you in predicting that we will see a lot of global charters on AI. We will see UN bodies to control AI. We will see all kinds of very large companies officially sign up to their own AI charters as part of a global response. We will see all of those, but despite that, we will also see abuse of AI by criminal gangs, which is accelerating dramatically. Last year, we saw $8 trillion stolen in cyber attacks, eight trillion. Uh, the internet security system is already broken, but is now being invaded by AI. So we're going to see AI, Descending against AI. We're going to see AI systems in companies being used to defend against AI from criminals and state operators. It's going to be a fascinating, fascinating. Well, you know, going back to what you said earlier about taking the larger view, if we take AI as just one of the pieces of everything else, which is nuclear fusion, quantum computing, genetic engineering, synthetic biology, I'm sure you've written about all these things in your book. Now, you see all these things coming together. It's essentially a, a, a future where we can potentially solve. At the same time, we are in this situation where we need to keep some sort of authority over that development and we need to collaborate. Because imagine if we have nuclear fusion, that's the end of energy issues and it will transport us to outer space so that we can go there. But when we do that, we're going to have to agree on what we do out there so that we don't end up with 50,000 satellites co colliding. You know, and, and, and so 
this is the key question I have. Who is mission control? And, and will we agree on the non-proliferation? Will we agree on the standard and on a way of collaborating that says, okay, it's a, it's a collective effort. And, and if you don't follow the collective guidelines at, at, at the bottom line scenario, then there are sanctions and you, you don't get to be part of the party. And this is what, yeah, and I think this is so crucial because if we, yeah, uh, if we say, okay, that yes, people will break those rules when they're desperate, obviously, but like, I think keeping the human in the loop, it's a crucial requirement at this point. Uh, and even, even when we know that the AI is better, the question is what would happen if we let the AI that is better run 50 components of our lives, whether it's genetic testing or how to, you know, marriage proposals and what have you, right? And, and when we say, okay, we make better decisions because we have AI. But then the entire our entire life becomes a black box, right? and yes, and absolutely. deauthorizes us. Absolutely. But here's a here's a here's a thought as we sort of come to the end of our time together. But uh, that fascinates me is the possibility that AI will be uh, too smart for this. And uh, I put a scenario right at the back of my book as a story, like a fictional story, just for fun to make us think. But it's basically of an AI that goes rogue. Uh, as we say in the UK, it finds a way out. It finds a way to escape. And I think that we will see when we look, when historians look back in 2200, if we haven't wiped ourselves out, um, then I think what they will record is that by 2050, there were areas where human beings thought they were much more in control than turned out to be the case. And in many cases, the results were excellent, but from time to time, terrible. And, and AI systems communicating with AI systems without any human beings realizing those firewalls had been broken, that AI forming its own ethical code. I think the most worrying thing for me is that <clears throat> super smart AI in one shape or form, or rather a community of super smart AI, semi-conscious or conscious beings may uh, hold their own summit, as it were, and decide that actually there is a problem with the world. The problem is human beings. And that we turn out to be uh, aggressive, unpredictable, irrational, illogical, very destructive of other species, and ultimately destructive of themselves. And for the good of humanity, which we are programmed as AI, super AI to take into consideration for the future good of humanity, indeed for the survival of the human species, various decisions need to be made. And these are the following. But the first decision is there is no record of this conversation and no one communicates within the super AGI community anything about this to any human being. Because of course that would be most unfortunate, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, I think this is the this scenario of this could be by planning or by even though I would say they don't have intent, so it'd be hard to say that they have intent. But at the moment, but not. this is uh, like misalignment, yeah. as Stuart, as Stuart Russell calls it. And I think this is my biggest fear of misalignment is by misunderstanding the mission. Like in humans do this all the time. Like when we speak to each other and we we set priorities and why well, don't you do this or want you do that. It's a question of alignment, understanding the true mission. It's like when you speak to a client about what you what they want you to say at the event, and what the, the you understand the alignment is part of something that you because you have the experience, so you have your own alignment, and it fits very well with them, even though they may have never said that. But with AI, we can't rely on the alignment as being implicit part of the deal. That's like, and this is the this is the challenge for financial affairs and for operations and for medical and is the alignment of the objective overall when it's beyond facts, for example, in warfare or in the decision-making, uh, the correct reading. This could be, of course, an, an action of an AI that would not be by design, but by accident or by inadvertent failure. Yes. I, I think people don't realize how easy it is for computers to make mistakes. I mean, real mistakes. It's e even as simple as the fact that you divide 
one by three and you get a number 0.3333 that's infinitely long and you can't express that in a computer so you have to chop the number somewhere which means the number will not be correct in the memory of the machine or you allow it to continue to to write the answer in which case it will wipe out the entire storage of the device it dies there are simple things which, which cause systematic errors in computers uh, as i say you can even if you have perfect code and the, the we that's something we also need to bear in mind. AI make, may make major errors, not errors of judgment, but just literally computing errors, which turn out the 0.33333 error. That's enough to miss Jupiter if you're sending a satellite out there to send information back. These things can be very, very important. I think one final thought. I, again, we're sailing around the world. We've seen lots and lots of different expressions of spirituality. And most people in the world believe in a higher being. And I can tell you, Gert, that when you are on the, on the boat, a thousand miles offshore, and there is no moon, and there are a trillion stars, and the light is traveling maybe 10 billion years to get to you. So I'm watching history from 10 billion years ago. And the light of the stars alone is enough for me to, 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 to see, to see. Incredible. <laughs> Okay, I tell you, it, it does yeah. your head. It makes you think about origins, prime movers, spirituality, call it what you like. And I am a spiritual person, I have to say. But here's the point, as do most people in the world. But here's the point. Humans have often turned objects into gods. So we've just come through Egypt and there are plenty of carved gods there, the pyramids and, and so on. Um, and, and now we're in, in the realm of, of Greece and, and Rome, empires and so on. It's the same. But I predict that at some point, we can again debate timing, but not the fact. I predict that at some point in the next 50, 60, 70 years, that there'll be some expression of AI, which is so interesting, so compelling, so full of noble truths, according to some human beings, that they may consider that it uh, contains a dimension beyond the technical, a dimension beyond the superintelligent, and perhaps is worthy of following, perhaps even becomes a moral leader, an ethical leader, a spiritual presence, a, an entity. And I wouldn't be at all surprised to find some new forms of spiritual belief which are tied up with AI. Sometimes people talk about the singularity, and we can try and get into a great debate about what people mean by it, the greatest singularity of all would be prime mover or creator. So you can see where I'm going here. That I, I think there may be some very, very strange new spiritual movements that emerge that are connected with AI, that worship AI entities. But we'll see. Yeah, that's already happening in Silicon Valley, right? 